Ah, uranium. There are so many things that you can do with it. You can use it to build a bomb, or power your city, or even build a second bomb. Uranium's an interesting element, that's for sure. It's no wonder why the US government wanted so much of it during the Cold War. It's because it's just so cool. They wanted it so badly, in fact, that they kicked off a prospecting frenzy comparable to the California Gold Rush almost 100 years before. In 1789, uranium was discovered by Martin Klaproth, who named it after Uranus, the Roman god. People had already been mining it for a very long time, but in 1871, the first American uranium mine opened in Colorado. It wasn't until 1896 that it was discovered to be radioactive by Henry Bequarrel. For a long time, there were only two real uses for uranium. You could research it, or you could make cool glass with it because it glows in the dark. Actually, I'm remembering this now after I already wrote this script and drew the images, but you could also, like, paint watch faces with it to make them glow in the dark. Anyway, so at this point in time, it's just kind of like a cool rock you can play with. That is until some physicists realize, if an atom decays of mass, energy is released. If you launch a neutron into the nucleus of another atom, it'll split into two smaller atoms. When it does this, a couple neutrons will fly off into other atoms. There would be a chain reaction, and with every split, more energy would be released. All of this energy being produced very quickly will result in, well, you know what. Also, uranium and plutonium are like the only elements you can use for this. World War II comes, America's the first country to make an atom bomb, and it ends the war. The uranium for the Manhattan Project wasn't really produced in the US. The majority was actually sourced from the Belgian Congo. This is kind of important later. With the end of World War II, the Cold War begins. Everybody's pretty scared of the Reds and is in agreement that the nation needs more nukes to protect itself. The government also remembers that in the early stages of the Manhattan Project, they created a self-sustaining nuclear reactor in Chicago. Yes, they tested the first nuclear fission reactor in a dense population center, but it worked, and this is a big deal because it means that you can also power a city with nuclear fission and not just blow it up. So now there are more uses for uranium. You can study it, make cool glass with it, power cities, and of course, blow up commies. The last two are on the minds of all Americans, and Uncle Sam has an absolute lust for the precious element. On August 1st, 1946, the Atomic Energy Commission is created when the Atomic Energy Act is signed into law by President Truman. Under the same act, the new AEC is given the job of controlling the production and use of nuclear energy and weapons. The AEC is ready to go all in on nuclear energy and weapons, but there's a problem. The United States isn't producing much uranium. Remember, the majority of the uranium for the Manhattan Project was produced outside of the homeland. The government thinks that relying on other countries for uranium is a bad idea and they want to increase domestic production, but how exactly are they supposed to do that? Do they just set up a bunch of AEC-owned mines? They could, but that's a lot of hard work and it costs an insane amount of money. That's when the fellows at the AEC come up with a genius plan. The Uranium Procurement Program. Instead of mining for uranium themselves, the AEC can just have random citizens do it for them and then buy the uranium off of them. By opening production of uranium up to all Americans, they could not only save a ton of time, effort, and money, but also receive way more uranium than they ever could if they were to just do it themselves. First, it's important to know what the prospectors are going to be looking for. These guys are going to be looking for triuranium octoxide. It's the most common natural form of uranium. It's sort of olive green and black, but I'm just going to color it green. It's incredibly stable. It can be milled into yellow cake, and then that yellow cake can then be processed and enriched until it's ready to be used for either energy or weapons. OSHA says it's incredibly toxic, not only by ingestion, but also by inhalation. It'll mess up your organs, especially your lungs. The Department of Energy even has first aid guidelines for this stuff. Yeah, not good. Okay, so the actual rush is coming next, I promise, but for clarification, I want to explain how the pricing will work in the AEC's program. Prices are based on the concentration of uranium in the ore that is handed to them. For example, let's say that the current prices are $5 for 0.5% concentration and $10 for 1% concentration. If you hand the AEC a 100 pound rock with a concentration of 1%, then there's one pound of uranium in there and they'll pay you $10. If you hand them a 200 pound rock and there's still one pound of uranium in it, then your rock has a concentration of 0.5%. As such, you only be paid $5 for your beloved rock. Well, that's unfair. Why are you being paid less even though you still brought them the same amount of uranium? Well, it's because you quite literally just handed them an extra 100 pounds of nothing, so they have to work a lot harder to get the uranium out. With all that out of the way, it's time for the AEC to get going. The AEC makes its first move in 1947 when they promise $10,000 to anybody who finds a uranium deposit. In April of 1948, Circular One is released. 
This sets a minimum price of $3.50 per pound of uranium outside of the Colorado Plateau. This is followed by Circular 2 that same month, which sets a $10,000 discovery bonus for ores with a concentration of 20% or more. The final circular in April is Circular 3, which just says that these prices will last for three years. In June of 48, Circular 4 is released. This not only modifies the three-year timeline given, but also introduces allowances. First is the development allowance, which is used for covering the cost of developing a uranium mine. It pays 50 cents per pound of at least 0.2% uranium, and the money must be used to develop a mine. The facilities allowance is next, and it partially covers the cost of building a mill to process the ore if the prospector wishes to do so. This one also pays 50 cents per pound. Finally is the haulage allowance, which covers the cost of transporting ore. It pays 6 cents per ton mile, up to 100 miles. The AEC really wants uranium, but they have some standards. They won't buy any ore with a concentration under 0.1%. The prices at the moment are as following. 30 cents for 0.1% concentration, and an extra 30 cents per extra 0.01% contained, up until 0.14%. 0.14% and all ores above will go for $1.50. The AEC purchases 38,000 tons of ore in 1948. Don't worry, they, they are not going to settle with this. In February of 1949, Circular 5 is released. This is a pretty big deal. Prices for uranium are now 50 cents for 0.1%, increasing 20 cents for each extra 0.01% contained until 0.15%, where it then increases by 10 cents and then caps out at $2 for 0.2% and above. Under this circular, the, these prices will last until June 30th, 1954. Interest in uranium explodes. A lot of Americans want to go mine some, but they know nothing. Everyone starts seeking information from the AEC, and, tired of people asking questions, the AEC releases Prospecting for Uranium, a complete guide to, well, prospecting for uranium. I actually own a copy. It includes information on ores that contain uranium, tips on where to look, information on the, on the legal aspects like staking claims and licenses and stuff, and it also includes sale procedures and even several ways to test your ore for uranium. My personal favorite is the photographic test. You get a small metallic object like a key and then place some black film on top like from a camera. You then put your rock on top of the film and then wait a bit. If the rock, which you've probably been holding in your hand for a while, creates an x-ray, then it's time to celebrate. You probably have uranium. The government is actively endorsing and incentivizing uranium mining, so it would be quite a shame if the uranium mining were to actually be dangerous. Unfortunately, the AEC doesn't have any data showing that uranium is bad for you. Except they do. German and Czech uranium miners had been frequently contracting cancer for a long time before the AEC was even created. Now, it hadn't been completely proven yet, but in 1949, the AEC knows pretty damn well that there's probably a connection between uranium and cancer. Mines are opening up all across the West because of government incentives, and the AEC and the U.S. Public Health Service decide that they should probably go measure radon levels in the mines that they are encouraging. This data collection begins in 1949 and will be finished in 1951. Also, when surveyors are measuring the levels of radon in the air, they aren't allowed to tell miners why they are there or that uranium mining is probably dangerous. Uh-oh. The Soviets have a bomb. The world is shocked and terrified. The Reds now have the power to annihilate Western cities, and the AEC is not about to take that disrespect. They've got some more circulars up their sleeves. The AEC purchases 173,000 tons this year, a major increase from the previous. It's 1950, and the American public is obsessed with atomic energy. So much so that the AC Gilbert Company releases the Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Lab, the perfect educational toy for your little one, which contains real uranium. Very cool. The AEC purchases 251,000 tons of ore this year. 1951 is here, and the data from the mines is ready. Radon levels are measured in picocuries per liter. For comparison, a healthy measurement of picocuries per liter is, uh, zero, but the average household concentration is uh, around 1.3. The EPA recommends you take action if levels in your household reach 4 picocuries per liter. Four picocuries per liter is equivalent to smoking eight cigarettes a day. Now it's time to look at the PHS's data. The picocuries per liter measured in the mines ranges from 37 on the low end all the way up to 22,000. By the way, if we use the previous rate of four picocuries per liter being equivalent to eight cigarettes, then going to work at a mine with a radon concentration of 22,000 picocuries per liter is equivalent to smoking 44,000 cigarettes a day. The AEC and PHS react with what I assume were audible, cartoonish gulps. They both agree that these mines need to be ventilated. 
Based on the radon measured in these mines, what they're doing is incredibly dangerous. The obvious next step is for the AEC to regulate the mines and protect the workers. And that's exactly what they do. In December of 1951, the AEC passes several regulations ensuring the safety of mines. Nah, I'm kidding. They did absolutely nothing. There are two possible reasons why. The first possibility, and the more cynical one, is that they didn't want to slow down production of uranium and feared that regulating the industry would do so. The second possibility is that they just didn't know what powers they had as they'd only been around for a little less than five years at this point. This is not really an acceptable excuse because even if they truly didn't know what they could do, they were still the only legal buyer of uranium, so if they didn't want to forcefully regulate them with laws, they could have just threatened to not buy from mines that didn't meet their demands. Anyways, the AEC is still mad about the new toy the Soviet Union has, and more circulars are here. In February of 1951, the AEC revises Circular 5. This increases prices yet again, and oh boy have they gone up. 0.1% now sells to the AEC for $1.50, and prices increase by 20 cents for each extra 0.01% concentration until it reaches 3.50 for 0.2%. These prices will last until June of 1954. In Minnesota, Mr. and Mrs. Pick's flour mill burns down, leaving them with nothing. Okay, this is an extremely awkward placement of such a fact, but I promise this is relevant. In the summer, the AEC releases Circular 6. The AEC will now pay an extra 350 per pound of uranium with a concentration of 0.2% or more. This bonus will end after the first 10,000 pounds. October rolls around and the AEC revises their Circular 5 revision, extending prices from June of 54 to March of 62. 1952. Vernon and Ruth Pick head west on vacation. Vernon, who's kinda bummed out because the livelihoods of both he and his wife were destroyed, heads to a store. He purchases some mining equipment and decides to try his luck with prospecting. He's unlikely to find any uranium, but hey, it's worth a shot. After all, what do the Picks have to lose? On June 21st, Vernon finally strikes uranium. The deposit is massive. So much so, he's able to open a mine which he later sells for $9 million. After taxes, he's left with around $6 million. I read an article written at the time where Vernon was asking the public what he should do with his newly acquired money. He literally had so much money he didn't know what to do with it. Hey, remember how the public health service was worried about the health effects of uranium mining? Well, it's June 26th and they've just issued a press release. Luckily, there isn't any evidence of health effects in uranium miners. They just sorta ignored the fact that cancer takes a long time to develop. I mean seriously, it's not like you can just smell uranium ore and then it immediately gets several forms of cancer. It takes time. Charles Steen is a former oil geologist from Texas who's currently unemployed. Also like the Picks, the Steen family doesn't have much to lose. The main difference between the two families is that the Picks didn't have four young kids with them. The Steen family has been running around the west with Charles in pursuit of uranium. He has a family to provide for, so he has a lot of weight on his shoulders. Unfortunately, he isn't having any luck. This isn't much of a surprise considering how he doesn't have any prospecting equipment. He's been chasing uranium with a second-hand diamond drill, his knowledge of oil geology, and an absent Geiger counter. Seriously, he didn't have any money for one. Eventually, the Steens end up in the small town of Moab, where Charles believes there's uranium. He's like the only guy who thinks this. Nobody else is looking there. He strikes uranium on July 6th, 15 days after Pick did. Turns out he's discovered a MASSIVE deposit. He opens the Mivita mine and turns Moab into the uranium capital of the world. Steen became a uranium millionaire with absolutely nothing, so what's your excuse? That, that that's a pretty good one. The AEC purchases 435,000 tons of ore this year. The rags to riches stories of Vernon Pick and Charles Steen inspire Americans, causing uranium fever to spread throughout the nation. Infected Americans grab their pickaxes and Geiger counters, racing to potentially earn bajillions of dollars. Over the past year or two, the PHS and AEC have been meeting with some mine owners suggesting that they ventilate their mines. Their actions don't go past asking nicely, and the only real repercussion for not ventilating is feeling guilty about hurting their feelings. A few of the mines oblige, but because there's nothing really stopping them, the rest don't. Some of the ventilated mines aren't even doing it properly. In 1953, the AEC purchases 734,000 tons of ore. In March of 1954, 100 men meet at a courthouse in Moab and discuss the issue of claim jumping because the government isn't doing a whole lot to help them. They create the Uranium Miners Protective Association to not only combat the frequent problem of claim jumping, but also make sure that disputes over claims are settled peacefully. In August, the Miracle Mining Company discovers ore with a uranium concentration of up to 30% in the Kern River Valley, located in California. People go insane, and so do some companies who stake a ton of claims. The owners of the Miracle and Kurgan mines prepare to make the big bucks. 
Unfortunately for them, the government deems all claims in a certain area of the county invalid, and theirs happen to be included. In 1954, the AEC purchases 1,106,000 tons of ore. It's trendy to mine uranium. It's even being advertised as a family activity, which sort of brings a whole new meaning to the term nuclear family. People are even bringing Geiger counters on vacation with them. You know, just in case they need them. Prospecting isn't the only way to make money. Uranium stocks are booming, and Salt Lake City has become the Wall Street of uranium. Countless companies are selling equipment for uranium prospecting. Even Sears is selling Geiger counters, and yes, the ad you're seeing right now is 100% real. In 1955, Gardner Games releases Uranium Rush, a board game that's fun for the whole family. The music industry is also impacted. Elton Britt releases Uranium Fever, a very good song about uranium prospecting. To the left of Elton are some other good songs made during this period that I listened to during the process of making this video. I highly recommend you give them a listen. Advice to Joe is pretty funny because it's just some dude singing to Joseph Stalin about how badly America's gonna nuke him. I would include them in the video, but I'm really not interested in getting sued by several companies over my hobby. June 3rd, Kern County, California. Remember the part of Kern County that the government invalidated the claims in? Well, the government is opening it up today, and the deadline to make claims is at 10 in the morning. Many at the site have partners in government offices staking claims already. Over a thousand prospectors are ready to rush in and make claims, and some of them are suspected to be wielding firearms. The local government is so worried about potential violence that they send in around 50 armed sheriff's deputies to make sure nobody kills each other. Even though the government deemed their claims invalid, the owners of the Miracle in Kurgan Mines ignite dynamite in the morning in search of more uranium. The clock strikes 10 and prospectors rush in. The potential of being shot by law enforcement is enough to deter violence and nobody runs around with their guns. It isn't extraordinarily calm and civil and there is some claim jumping, but the most intense fighting is just going to be between two guys arguing in a courtroom later. The prospectors in Kern County aren't the only ones going crazy. People are so willing to go all in on prospecting that people begin to warn everyone not to sell their homes and other assets in their quests for uranium. Over the course of the past couple years, several towns have exploded in population. These are referred to as yellow cake boom towns. In 1955, the AEC purchases 1,524,000 tons of ore. The PHS has been examining the health effects of uranium and radiation in miners for the past few years. To make matters worse, they aren't even telling these guys why they're being examined. It's also worth mentioning that during this same time period, the PHS is actively studying the long-term effects of syphilis at the Tuskegee Institute. The data they're collecting doesn't look great, and the AEC is pretty worried about all the uranium miners getting cancer. They decide to just chill and let the states enact laws. In 1956, they purchased 3,005,000 tons of ore. In 57, 3,675,000 tons. In 1958, the Lucy Desi Comedy Hour, starring Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, releases an episode where the gang catches uranium fever and goes prospecting. I actually watched it, and it's pretty good. I could be biased, though, because I love Lucy. The uranium procurement program has been successful. The government has a ton of uranium stockpiled, which means that they should probably cool it with the purchases. The problem, though, is that a bunch of deposits have recently been developed. It would be cruel to just pull the rug out from under people who've invested a ton of time, effort, and money into developing. In November of 1958, the AEC announces a new plan. They aren't going to buy any ore anymore, just pure uranium. They'll also do so at $8 per pound. If you want to make money from your mine, you have to have developed it before the November announcement. Because they're just buying pure uranium, you have to sell your ore to a plant at a negotiated price because the AEC isn't guaranteeing those anymore. That plant will then process your ore and sell the uranium to the AEC. If you truly want to sell your ore to the AEC, they can buy it from you at whatever price they want, and that's if they decide to do business with you, which isn't even a guarantee. This will take effect in 1962. This new policy is meant to curtail the amount of uranium being purchased while also attempting to keep the uranium industry alive until the private sector is ready to take over. Because the AEC isn't really going to buy ore anymore and won't purchase any uranium from places that weren't developed before November of 1958, uranium fever is effectively killed. A sad day for us all. Despite their recent initiative to relax, the AEC purchases 5,178,000 tons of ore. 1959. Both organizations believe that their silence has gone a bit too far. The Bureau of Mines has been leasing mines for a while, and the AEC tells them to go make sure that these mines are following their suggestions. Because mine owners aren't really interested in having the government shut down their mine, they begin to ventilate well. This only really applies to mines that the Bureau of Mines is leasing. Completely private ones can still kind of do whatever they want. 
The PHS finally decides to serve public health and begins handing out pamphlets to miners about the health effects of uranium. The AEC purchases 6,935,000 tons of ore in 1959, and because they want to end this video on a nice even year, they purchase 7,970,000 tons in 1960. So yeah, I think I'm going to end it here. The rush is over, and not much else is going to happen. The Yellow Cake Boomtowns rapidly decreased in population, legal regulation came to the entire industry, the AEC kept the industry alive until private nuclear plants were able to do so, and the government eventually compensated the uranium miners. The reason I decided to make a video on this topic is because nobody really cares about it. I mean, I do of course, but you know. I was playing a game with my friend, not Fallout by the way, and the song Uranium Fever started playing. It was my first time hearing about the uranium rush, so I went to go watch a YouTube video on it, but I couldn't find anything. I was so sad and annoyed that I just decided to do it myself. It sucks, man. I feel like it's a fascinating piece of American history that's unfortunately very neglected. You might think differently after watching this, but I assume that if you've gotten this far, you probably agree. Anyways, is there anything we can learn? Uh, probably. I guess if the government starts offering to pay for bottles of mercury, you probably shouldn't drop everything and chase it. Or maybe I'm just some random doubter who's mad I'll never be a Mercury bazillionaire. See ya.